Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> How many of you are just so thankful for the presence of the Lord? Amen. Hallelujah. It's truly an honor to be with you today. And I'm just so thankful to God for this amazing house, my amazing friends that have welcomed me into your house. And I don't take that lightly. I don't. Like, I, I honor every invitation that comes. And I, I don't take it lightly. I pray, I ask the Lord, what do you, you know, when you go to someone's house, in America, it's polite to bring something <laughs> when you go to someone's house. And if you're an American, it's polite to bring something to eat. You don't go to somebody's house hungry, ready to eat what they got. <laughs> You go to their house to at least bring something for everyone to eat on. And that's what it is sometimes when you go and preach the gospel. You go carrying something that Jesus has placed inside of you for the people to be able to receive. And you know, you don't just invite strangers into your house. Say, come on and eat. You can. Thank you, Jesus, for that. But... When someone trusts you enough to feed your family, that's huge. And I want to say thank you to Jesus for that. I don't take this lightly. I'm so honored and humble that you guys would ask me to come. And I, I'm just thankful to the Lord for that. So let's give your pastors a hand. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. We honor them today. In Jesus' name. Wow. And, um, whoa, <laughs> y'all have to excuse me today. Um, I, I'm, wow, Jesus. <laughs> um, wow, this is a very uh, important service. It's a very um, serious service. I'm going to try not to cry, but I feel like today there's going to be a commissioning. I feel like today very strong in the spirit that some of you are going to be marked for eternity today. Today's not just going to be a service. It's not. It was so prophetic that you guys sang that song, Word of God Speak, Pour Down Like Rain washing my eyes to see your majesty because the Word of God is going to do that for you today. The power of the word of God is going to literally transform you. And today, as we get into this word, that, and I believe it's a prophetic word for this nation. And if you're visiting from other nations, I see my English family, my brothers and sisters here. Woohoo! No matter what nation you're coming from, God is going to use his word, this prophetic word, to speak into your heart transform your life and mark you for eternity because God wants to do something in your nation. How many of you believe that Jesus is coming soon? And if you don't believe it, that's okay. You don't have to. Um, I love uh, what Dr. Jesse Duplantis says that you can stay here if you want. <laughs> but the Bible says that Jesus will return again. The Bible says that one day Jesus will open up the skies and cause us to ever be with him. And he's going to rescue us. And some people argue, they say, you know, the word rapture is not in the Bible. And it's not. You, you can't find it. But the Greek word for rapture is in the Bible. And that Greek word is harpazo. Harpazo. And that I heard a Greek theologian, a very famous Greek theologian, say this not too long ago, and I'd never heard this definition before. Basically, harpazo means catching away. It means to be raptured away. That's the word that the scripture uses. But it actually says this in the Greek. To be caught away before impending doom before impending danger it's literally in the greek it literally is the snatching away before something bad is about to happen 
My friends, that is what Jesus is leading us to. Because the Bible says that he's coming to judge the world. He's coming to take care of the things that have separated us from him far too long. And not only is he coming to do that, but the Bible says that he will rule in righteousness. That's the whole point of his coming. He's not coming to be a God that says, I'm mean. I'm a Viking. No, no, no. Jesus isn't doing that. He's coming to make war against the plans of the enemy. But the primary focus of his coming is to establish the kingdom of God on the earth again. And the Bible says that before bad things happen, he's going to snatch us away so that we could go to be with him. And then the end will come. You might be thinking, what does that have to do with today's service? (laughs) Everything to do with today's service. Because there is an act of preparation that must take place before the coming of the Lord. The Bible says in Matthew 24 that this gospel shall and must be preached in every nation. In every nation. I found out the other day when I was on Linden that there are 375,000 people that need to hear Jesus in this nation. 375,000. I've been coming here for since 2015, and that was the first time I ever heard that number. I thought, oh, Iceland's a Christian nation. Everybody's saved. (laughs) <laughs> the Iceland Chief Church said, amen. <laughs> like, oh, that ain't, no. That's not right. They're not all saved. But does Jesus love Iceland? Does Jesus want the gospel preached to the 375,000 that don't know him? He absolutely does. How are they going to hear the gospel preach? The Bible says, how can they hear unless there be a preacher? And how can there be a preacher? Whoa, God, I see it. Unless one is sent. God actually wants to send some people in this room. I said, God wants to send, I'm prophesying right now, some people in this room. And even tonight, all all throughout this time, and I don't feel like I'm going to preach long because I feel like the fire of God's going to fall today and burn our hearts, brand our hearts for to carry this end time message. Not only that Jesus is coming, but to declare that Jesus still loves the 375,000 people that are on the outside of those doors that need to hear that he is alive and that he is a God that loves them and that he wants them to be harpazoed. He wants them to be raptured. Would you want your children to face impending danger if you knew it was on the horizon? What would you do if your child stepped out off of the curb and there was an oncoming car, you would snatch that child back. Whoa. But oftentimes we as the church, instead of snatching them out of darkness, we like to keep them there. People are getting hit. People are dying. People are suffering. But the heart of Jesus is still John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God still loves the world. But you have to know the world that he's calling you to. Who's he calling you to today? Who's Jesus calling you to stop for the one and to reach out to them and show them the love of Jesus? I believe in Jesus' name that before Jesus comes, that 375,000 will be reached. Hallelujah. 
I believe it. And I believe that I'm sent here to encourage you guys, to help fan that flame, to say, run for Jesus. Run for Jesus. Go out and just witness the, with the love of God, the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. God wants to reach the world. And he's going to do it through each and every one of us. The Lord's given me a couple of scriptures for us to focus on today. Let's turn to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. Actually, before we go there, let's go to Isaiah 26. Sorry about that. Isaiah 26, verse 15. And we were reading this this morning in our, our prayer time, uh, myself and our missions team from America. You can wave your hands, guys. Let people know you're here. Amen. Wow. Isaiah 26, verse 15. It says, you, God, have increased the nation." I was declaring that over Iceland this morning. You, God, have increased the nation. You are glorified. You have expanded all the borders of the land. He's done this. The Bible says it's the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. I uh, was told this morning that there was a supernatural sign in the heavens last night. They said it made the news. Around the time that we were having service, supernatural sign in the heavens. And I text my, my, my mom, my spiritual mom, Heidi Baker, uh, a few minutes ago about it. And she said um, how it's been ex they've been experiencing that same sign in Mozambique the last few months. I feel the fire of God on that. Come on, let's give God praise for that. And it actually, it's, it's a natural phenomenon. I've seen it before. Uh, it's a natural phenomenon that just occurs whenever. I don't think it's predictable. Right, Mark? I don't think it's, it's a predictable thing. But um, it occurs supernaturally, I believe. But each time that I've seen it, it looks like an eye, someone's eye. And as I looked at it, I said, God's eye is on Iceland. God's eye, his focus is on this nation. And I'll tell you why here. And we'll prophesy here in just a minute. You, God, have increased this nation. You, God, have increased the nation. You are glorified. You have expanded all the borders of the land. Lord, in trouble, they have visited you. Notice it doesn't say in good times. It's very interesting. In trouble, they, who? The nation has visited you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening was upon them. I wonder what's getting ready to come. As a woman with child is in pain and cries, oh, I feel God on this, cries in her pains when she draws near the time of her delivery. So we have been in your sight, O oh Lord. The Bible says that Zion brings forth her children in travail in childbirthing. And sometimes when things seem so volatile and violent and painful and hurtful, we think that's because something is wrong with us, but we don't realize that God's getting ready to birth something beautiful in our lives. God's getting ready to do something beautiful in our lives. Somebody needs to hear that today, that the baby is about to be born.
The baby, the promise of God that you've been carrying in your spirit for nine months or nine years, it doesn't matter. I prophesy today that the pain that you have been enduring is only going to last for the night because joy is coming in the morning. God's promise is going to come to pass for your life and for this nation. I want you to prophesy that to yourself today, that the pain is worth the purpose. The purpose of the pain is to produce the will of God in your life, the promise of God in your life. Let's keep reading. Verse 18. This is a very interesting verse. And I was so puzzled when I was reading and praying it this morning. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. One of the translations says, basically, like, I've been in childbirth, but I didn't birth anything. I've been in tremendous pain, but nothing came out of it. It literally says, I've been in childbirth, but I birthed wind. No baby, no promise, nothing to show for it. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth. Talk about conviction. He's saying here, the prophet is saying here, we haven't accomplished anything. We haven't birthed anything. We thought we were birthing something, but nothing came out of it. I, mean, I just endured all this pain for nothing. Nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. And then he goes on and he talks about different things and prophesies about different things. But there was a reason why they weren't able to birth anything. Because in order to birth, you have to carry seed. In order to birth, you have to carry seed. Am I speaking to any women in here? I can't talk to the men because we ain't never born nothing. Thank you, Jesus, because I do not want to bear no babies. No, no, no. Women are very strong. I dare say stronger than men, because if that was the case, God would have allowed men to bear children if we could endure that pain. But, honey, I do not want to even know what it feels like to bear a baby. So that way makes women really strong. Amen. I love when God liberates women. Thank you, Jesus. Whoa. But God has made it sovereign so that a woman can carry what is supposed to be produced in the earth. But that woman cannot get pregnant without a seed. And the Bible says... That the word of God is literally the seed from heaven. If you look it up in the Greek, it literally means sperma. The sperm of the word of God is the seed that is planted into our hearts to birth what heaven wants to be released into the earth. Word of God, speak. What does that mean? Lord, plant your seed in me to birth what you want birthed in the earth. If you don't have the seed, you don't have a baby. If you don't have the seed, you can't birth anything. What did the prophet say? You birth wind. I'm in pain. Well, what are you birthing? I don't know. Women know when they are birthing a baby. They, they can tell, and I've heard stories. I've heard stories from women. They say, I just knew it was the time. 
And the doctor's like, oh, no, you got a little bit longer. You, no, this baby's coming. I know. I don't know how, but I know that I know that I know that I know this baby is coming. And the women that had babies say amen. <laughs> and you knew when that baby came forward that what you perceived to be <laughs> was true. You didn't have any proof. You didn't see that baby inside. You couldn't look inside of you and say, oh, yeah, I got a baby. The only evidence was you began to change. Whoo, I'm preaching to somebody. You begin to change. You begin to grow. You begin to increase. You begin to get hungry. Things began to change on the inside of you until the baby was ready to be born. God's wanting to do the same thing in regards to this nation. God wants to impregnate people with the promise of his word concerning the 375,000 that are outside of this church that need to hear that he's alive and that he loves them. But he's looking for people to carry the word. He's looking for people to carry the word, even if you don't live in this nation, back to the nation that he's called you to. I could say this, but I'm trying to be politically correct here. I don't want to be, I don't think it would be strange to say this. I believe it's safe. But it has to be willing. You don't get pregnant. You can get pregnant by force. And that's called rape. But God is not going to do that. He's looking for a willing vessel that's going to say, God, like Mary, be it unto me according to your word. I believe when Mary said those words, the seed of what that angel prophesied to her came on the inside of her. The Bible says in John, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In that moment when Mary said, I'm going to receive what this angel is telling me, Jesus became alive on the inside of her. The sperma of God's word literally took on flesh on the inside of her until she was able to birth what was promised to her. God's wanting you to birth things in regards to your nation. But you have to be willing to birth the promise, to do what it takes, to pray, to travail. We talked about that last night, to supplicate, to be able to remain until to bear, the word uh, uh, to birth is to bear down in the scripture. Where you bear down and you push until something happens. God's wanting that in regards to what he's called you to do. In regards to this nation, amen. Next scripture, and we're almost done. As, whoa, Isaiah chapter forty. Verse 2, excuse me, verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That means in the desert, in the place that looks abandoned, in the place that is not currently bearing fruit. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. How is that way prepared? Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Whew. How do we do this? Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain brought low. Every crooked place made straight. And the rough places made smooth. Why? Here's why. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. What does that mean? The baby is going to come. Hallelujah. And the birthing of what God wants birth in this time is his glory. 
is his presence. The Bible says in Isaiah 60, to arise and shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. You might be thinking, me? Yes, you. God wants his glory to rise upon you so that the world outside of here and whatever nation you're in can see that he's alive. All flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Verse 6, the voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry out? Just like Mary, be it unto me according to your word, God. In order for the glory, so I'm just now seeing this. Notice he said, cry out. Doesn't say laugh out. Do you know any women that laughed their way into delivery? Ha 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 the baby's coming. Ha 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 ha. Most of the time it's ah, ah. It hurt. Unless they gave you epidural and then that's another story. I don't know if they have that in this country, but that's another story. I hear it's like a sedation vacation. You're Whoa, yeah, I can do this because there's no pain. But there is pain sometimes associated with the birthing of the promise. And that's what he's saying to Isaiah. Cry out. Cry out. How do we cry out? In prayer. In supplication, that is the birthplace of what God wants to do in your life, in your ministry, in your church, in your nation. You want God to do something? Pray it out first. Cry it out first. Travail. Supplicate. To see what's on the heart of the Father and receive that as seed into your heart to birth the promise of God. We're going to look at one story and then we're going to pray. Turn to <laughs> Second, or no, First Kings chapter 16 and verse 30. This is about Elijah and Ahab, and Jezebel. First Kings, uh -huh. 1 Kings 16, verse 30, 3 zero. Okay? It says, now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> more than all who were before him. That's a bad man. <laughs> if your reputation is you did more evil in the sight of God than anybody else, I don't even know if I want to be your friend because judgment must be coming to your house. Verse 31. And it came to pass as though it were a little thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam that he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshiped him. Literally, <laughs> this is so interesting. He thought it was a really small thing to be married to Jezebel. He's like, oh, it's no big deal. No big deal. She probably was a beautiful woman. Oh, no big deal. I'm going to marry this girl named Jezebel. <laughs> and if you study it out, the name Jezebel literally is a conjuring. Do you know what it means to conjure? To call up. It's a word that's used with witches. When they conjure something up, they bring something up through um, mediums. That name Jezebel is a chant or a conjuring. Chant is better. Uh, her name literally means calling on the prince. 
You know what the Bible calls the enemy, Satan? The prince of the power of the air. So every time they called the name Jezebel, they would call forth the spirit of that prince. Does that make sense? And Ahab thought, oh, it's not a big deal to marry somebody whose name calls on the devil. It's not a big deal. But Ahab was king. Did we think that's a big deal? It's a big deal. The king has now, he's already doing evil. Now he's doing something even more evil by aligning himself with someone who's yielded to Satan. Calling her name was literally calling Satan. (laughs) He thought it wasn't a big deal. And then all of a sudden, you never see Elijah until this happens. You never hear of Elijah until this happens. Then all of a sudden, verse 1 of chapter 17, Elijah the Tishbite, he comes out of nowhere. This is the Joseph Harris translation. Here comes a prophet out of nowhere, and he says to the one that gave himself to evil, guess what? It's not going to rain here any longer. Because of what you've done, this ain't going to happen anymore. That's powerful. What was Elijah doing? He was doing what the prophet Isaiah, what we just read, to clear a pathway for God to come in. Make straight in the desert a highway for God. Every hill and mountain be brought low. The one that was in power that was yielded to wickedness, God sent a prophet carrying the promise of what God wanted to do in that nation and said, hey, guess what? The glory is getting ready to manifest and I'm coming to prophesy against what the devil wants to do and I'm prophesying by the promise of the spirit what Jesus wants to do and I'm making the pathway straight for God to come in. Don't tell me God doesn't want to take care of evil. If he has to send a prophet, he'll send a prophet. But what if God wants to send you? Yeah, silence. We say in America, it got quiet in this Baptist church. And if you skip on down, you know you read and understand what happened. Elijah fled. He went into a cave, and then he came out. God provided for him. All these different things started to happen. And then the Lord spoke to him, and he said, go and present yourself to Ahab again and tell him what I've said. Prophesy the promise prophesy the promise of what I am saying is going to happen. When it doesn't look like it's going to rain, God's saying, guess what? It's about to rain. So he goes, and he presents himself to Ahab. And I love uh, in verse, in chapter 18, verse 17, Ahab saw Elijah and he called him. He said, Are you, oh, is that you, the one who's making trouble in Israel? Is that you, oh, troubler of Israel? He couldn't even see himself as the one who was troubling Israel. So he tried to blame it and say, is that you who troubles Israel? And Elijah said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed after Baal. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me, I know, Lord, on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah and eat at Jezebel, who eat at Jezebel's table. I could go into a whole thing on that about how those are what spiritually, they spiritually represent what witches are today. 
people who commune with darkness to manifest it over regions, to manifest it over, uh, how do I say that, Lord? Over cities and over nations. But God took care of it. And the Bible says that he brought them all, y'all know this story, to Mount Carmel for a showdown. <laughs> bang, bang. <laughs> He brought them all to Mount Carmel, and I've been to Mount Carmel many times in Israel. It's one of my absolute favorite places to go in all the world. We're going on a tour uh, with our missions team and stuff in November. If you guys want to join us, just go on our website. Uh, uh, it's josephharrisministries.org, and all of the information is on there. We have the cheapest uh, Israel trips in the world. Thank you, Jesus, because normally it's very expensive to go. But all of that to say, that was a little shameless plug there. <laughs> but all of that to say, on Mount Carmel, they're all gathered together. And I used to think that it was just Elijah and the prophets of Baal. But the Bible doesn't say that. It says it was all of Israel. All of Israel was about to see what God was going to do. All of Israel was about to see the promise of that baby come forth. And as a result of that, we know the Bible says that, you know, Elijah's like, call on Baal, tell him to come. Light fire, whoever's God answers by fire, that's the one that's going to be the one we worship. And so they start calling out to Baal, and they're cutting themselves, and they're bleeding to death, and nothing is happening. See, you can always count on darkness to leave you when you need it. Did you hear me? Darkness is not your friend. It will always leave you helpless and abandon to the point where you begin to kill yourself. That's what they were doing. But, and Elijah's sitting there making fun of him. Bless his heart. He was so cheeky. <laughs> he was like, oh, I guess Baal's sleeping today. <laughs> Might want to cut a little deeper. <laughs> Nothing's happening. But then we know the Bible says that Elijah took 12 stones, numbering the tribes of Israel. What was that? That was a manifestation of what God wanted to do in that nation. It was a prophetic sign of what God wanted to do in that nation. And he said, Israel shall be your name. What was that? You know, when you birth a promise, you name the baby. When you birth the promise, you name the baby. And he said, this promise is coming forth, and Israel shall be your name. God's wanting you to prophesy and to say what the name of that promise is going to be for your nation, for your life, for this ministry. The Bible says in verse 38 that the fire, I know, Lord, fell Sorry if I keep saying it because I hear him say things as where, whoa, reading the scripture. This is what's going to happen at the end of the day today. In just a few minutes, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Here's the end result. Verse 39. When all the people, who were all the people? The nation of Israel. When all the people saw the promise. What happened? They fell on their faces. And they began to say, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. 
Can you hear Iceland declaring that today? The Lord, he is God. Can you hear the UK declaring that today? The Lord, he is God. Can you hear the United States of America declaring that today? The Lord, he is God. Can you hear every nation, every tribe, every tongue declaring today? The Lord, he is God. And you might be saying, oh, that nation is too dark. That nation is too hard for God to reach. Last time I checked, Jesus prophesied and he said, one day will come when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father who's willing to carry that promise, who's willing to carry the promise of what God wants to do not just in your nation, not just in your ministry, not just in, the reason why I'm here is because God has sent me with the promise to prophesy and to declare, and not even the promise to, to prophesy and declare, but to help encourage you to receive the promise of what the Father wants to do in your country and in your nation. God's not going to send me just to, do something in your nation. He wants to send you. He wants to send you, but I know God has sent me too as well. I would not be here if God did not send me. He sent me when nobody, I wasn't traveling, going nowhere. He sent me in 2015 here by myself. Well, not by myself. Was my, my buddy Sean was with me. He sent me here to this nation. I didn't know anybody. I was scared out of my mind, but I had a promise from God. I had a promise from God that God wanted to shift and change things in this nation so that, so that no one would align with darkness. And I'm realizing now, do you know the reason why I came? I shared this, I think, last night. The reason why I came was because I was in my my, my room praying, and I heard the Lord say, I'm going to give you Psalm 2.8, ask of me, I'll give you the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your possession. And I began to pray that scripture. I began to pray that promise. And the Lord spoke the name Scandinavia to me, and I looked it up and saw Iceland was a part of Scandinavia. And when I got to Iceland, the anointing of God hit me. The power of God began to hit me. And as it did, I felt to look up on Google and type in Iceland that day. And the number one national news on CNN World News that day was that someone in Iceland wanted to erect a statue to a Norse god that they used to worship back in the old days. Yeah, no, no. Do you know why it's a no, no? Same reason why we just read. Yeah. Was it a little thing? That's a little thing to just have a statue. It's no big deal to have a statue to a Norse god. Oh, no big deal. That's what Ahab said. <laughs> god said, uh-uh. God from heaven, think about that. I'm sitting in my room in Baltimore, Maryland, not even thinking about Iceland. <laughs> not, it wasn't even on my radar. And God's like, no, I want to send you there to use your authority to stop that from manifesting and coming to pass. Last time I checked, I don't think they ever built it. Never heard of it. And if the Icelandic people know, let me know. But I don't think, I don't think so. You know why? Because God sent me with the promise. You never even had to hear about it because God took care of it. And all you've seen is the promise of God's spirit and what he wants to manifest. Let's stand to our feet.